something really different this Christmas. Somebody asked me how different. I'm glad you asked. As you leave today, you're going to get a postcard. It's going to hand it to you in the foyer. This postcard simply says, Valley Worship presents Unexpected. We're putting a, a musical together for Christmas this year, and we're going to do it on Friday, the 15th of December, and then on the 17th, we're going to do it three times for our three services. Here's what you need to keep in mind. We're going to try something brand new, and I want everyone to really practice hard right now of avoiding the spirit of offense. Mm. Mm. We're going to try something brand new so we can seat everybody. Christmas is a big time. People bring their families. People are in town. We want to seat everybody. So we're going to ask you to register for the service you want to attend. Now, if you just flat refuse, come to church. It's not a big deal. We just want to make sure you have a seat. Look around. This is an average crowd for 945. Okay? Christmas is going to probably double that for this service. We want to give you a seat. So here's what you want to do. When, when you get to the back of this card, there's a QR code, and you'll take your camera, put it on there, touch it. It's going to take you to a website, and you register. You're going to have your choice of four services for this. One's on a Friday night. The other three are Sunday morning at our regular service times. We want you to give us information, like your email address, so we can send you a reminder that you signed up for this particular service. My family, we, we love going down to the theater downtown, the Mill Mountain, and we, we'll buy tickets. And the, the craziest thing is if you buy a ticket and you forget you bought a ticket for that night. If someone would have told me, I, I needed a reminder. Reminders are good, all right? So everybody say, love Pastor Jason, and I'm going to register. Not everybody said, I'm going to register. You got to say, I'm going to register. So we want, you to, we want you to do that. This is going to be an experiment for us because we have Easter coming up, and we're expecting to have over 1,000 for Easter. We want to be able to accommodate everybody and serve you. And so because we're limited by the space, we have to multiply our services and in doing so, we want to make sure that we can accommodate and serve everybody and everybody gets a seat, okay? Somebody mentioned to me about overflow. I, I refuse personally to sit in overflow. I want to be in the room. I don't want to watch it on the screen. Amen, Jason. I agree. Get me a seat. Then you register. If you register, I'll get you one. Then I will register and then I'll have a seat. Good. That's how the conversation is had. Listen, I've toured with how to start this message today. This is week three of Keep the Receipt. So I'm going to give you a lot of scripture. I've, I've told so many stories that I, you know, I don't, I hate retelling stories, but some of them are just that good. You know, and all of mine are true stories. They're true stories. So I'm, I want to talk about walking today. Walking by the Spirit. Walking with the Spirit. And and so I thought about this story, and I've told it before, but I think it's so rich, I need to tell it again. Can I, can I tell something again for those who didn't hear it? Well, I heard a story about these two boys and two young men, and they were hunting in the woods, and they were walking down a path and just coming out of the woods, didn't catch anything, didn't shoot anything today. So they're leaving, and they're walking down this path, and they notice this massive hole in the middle of the path. And they stop and look at the hole, and the hole is so deep, they cannot see the bottom. So one of them says, hey, how deep do you think this hole is? The other one says, I don't know. We need to do an echo test. He goes, what's an echo test? He says, throw something down in that hole, and let's listen to hear the echo. It'll tell us how deep it is. So he picked, one of them picks up a rock, and he throws it down into the hole, and they wait, and they don't hear anything. So he picks up another rock, throws it in the hole. They hear nothing. And the one says, man, find something really big and throw in that hole. And so he looks around and he sees an anvil sitting beside the hole. So he picks up this anvil and he throws it in the hole and they're listening for an echo coming out of the hole. They hear nothing. But then something is heard coming down the mountain. They can hear the rustling of leaves and trees being hit upon. They look up and here comes this goat 
running down the mountain as fast as it can. The boys get nervous, they step back, and the goat gets right to the boys and jumps up in the air and jumps in that hole. And the boys are amazed, did you, did you see that? Was that a goat? Was that, that was a goat, it ran down the hill and jumped up and fell in this hole. And they were just amazed. Then a third man walks up on the scene. He says, hey guys, have y'all seen a goat around here? And they said, have we seen a goat? It came running down this mountain and jumped up in the air and jumped in this hole. That's probably your goat. And the third man said, hey, nah, that's not my goat. They said, how do you know it's not your goat? He said, my goat was tied to an anvil. I think that's a true story. <laughs> I want to talk to you about walking today. In, in Matthew 26, it tells the story of the Last Supper. And so for your entertainment today, I want to tell you my version of that story really quickly, that Jesus took his disciples out for a meal that evening. They get to the restaurant and, and Jesus walks in and he's leading the party and he tells the person at the door, they said, how, how many are you seating tonight? He says, I need a table for 26. They said, 26? And the person was counting, he said, but you only have 13 in your party. He said, I know. I need 26 because we all sit on the same side of the table when we eat. Has anybody seen the painting of the Last Supper? This is, this is Jesus and the disciples. What were the words the last words Jesus said to his disciples before this picture was taken. He said, gentlemen, if you're going to be with me, if you're going to walk with me, if you're going to minister with me, you got to sit on my side of the table. So I want to tell anybody in this house, if you're going to walk with Jesus Christ, you got to get over on his side of the table. Okay? And I want to talk to you about how do we do that? How do we walk with Jesus? How do we sit on the same side of the table with Jesus? Is you have to be walking by the Spirit of God. When I say Spirit, I mean the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. In this room, we have so many people here that were brought up in different churches, different denominations, but somehow you find yourself sitting at Valley Church this morning. So what I want to do is I want to bring us all to the same page today. If I can show you in Scripture something, would you believe it? I got, a, I got an amen corner here. I need, I need some out here. If the Bible says it, would you believe it? If it goes contrary to what you were taught growing up, but the Bible says it, would you believe it? Either we believe the Word of God or we don't. That's where we're at. So I want to show you what the Bible talks about walking by the Spirit. In the Pentecostal circles, we believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We believe when, when that happens, there's evidences that come by the, by the gifts of the Spirit. I don't want to get into all that today. I want to talk about walking by the Spirit. Why do we need to walk by the Spirit? What are the benefits of walking by the Spirit? Who said we need to walk by the Spirit? And I just want to open up the Bible for you today, and I want to show you some receipts. In the series called Keep the Receipts, if you've got the receipt, that means it's been paid for. I got the proof of the purchase. And so I'm going to go kind of quick today, so if you can't write a lot, just do like everybody else does, just take a picture of the screen. All my scriptures will be on the screen behind me. I think I've got everything spelled correctly. I fixed one more thing this morning. Uh, the Satan got in my computer, and messed up my spell check. Are we ready? Let's stand for the reading of God's word. As I preface this, I'm gonna tell you that two must agree to walk together. If any two people are gonna to walk together, they've got to agree to walk together. Two people must be in agreement to do anything in life together. If they're, if they're business partners, they've got to agree to a certain thing. If they're married, they've got to agree that we're gonna to walk together. I've never performed a wedding where the, where the bride and the groom, where one of them refused to be there. They both chose, they may, they may change their mind later, but at that point, they both chose to be there. 
and they made a choice. We're going to choose to walk together. When you walk into a relationship with Jesus Christ, if you know the Word of God, then you are making a choice to walk by the Holy Ghost, to walk by the Spirit. And that's what I want to show you today. So I'm going to be in Galatians chapter 5. I'm going to start in verse 16 and 17. These are the words of the Apostle Paul. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. Paul said one time in another place, he said, he said, my flesh and the spirit wrestle, fight every day on who's going to be stronger. He says, every day I crucify my flesh so the spirit will be stronger. A little bit later, he says in, in Galatians chapter 5, verse 25, he says this, if you live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. When I read that walk, it means I'm going to live my life by it. As I walk down the road, the Spirit walks with me. When I walk into Walmart, the Spirit walks in with me. When I walk into my house, the Spirit walks in with me. When I go to school, the Spirit walks. Wherever I go, I'm walking by the Spirit and with the Spirit. And where He goes, I go. And where I go, He goes. So before I start today, I want to, want to let everybody know the grammatical mistakes we make. Please do not ever call the Holy Spirit an it. He is the third person of the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. Jesus refers to him as he. Do not ever call the Holy Spirit an it. And I heard an old song the other day. It says, I got it, I got it, I got it. I got it. There's something about the Holy Ghost. I can't explain it, but I got it. And I said, I don't know if that's grammatically correct. But I think they were talking about the power. They got the power, it. But if you're thinking about the Holy Spirit, I got him. I got him. Are we ready? We're going to have some fun today. I want to teach you today. I want you to learn. I want you to be a student today. I'm going to do my best to, to just peel back the scriptures and let you see what, what was prophesied about, what has come, how did it get here, how do, how do we to handle it, and how am I to walk away with it? Are we ready? Yes. Lift your hands with me. Father, today, we thank you, Lord, for your spirit, and we ask you, Lord, release your spirit into this place. Holy Spirit, have your way today. Change us. Empower us. Equip us to be your examples and be your mouthpieces here on this earth. Let us not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Give us power to be witnesses today. We ask in Jesus' mighty name, and everyone said, amen. Before you see to tell three people, let's walk by the way of the Spirit. Thanks, Gordon. Robert, you have to help me out today, man. You going to help me out? Okay. When, when you walk, a normal person walks forward. We can walk backwards, but we're really designed to move forward. We move forward at a much faster pace. We can change direction and still move forward. Moving forward by walking is going from point A to point B as quickly as you can. That, that's the point of walking. It, it's also known as advancement. If I'm going to walk by the Spirit, that means I'm going to advance by the Spirit. I'm, I'm going to gain ground by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a real force. It's, a real, it's not something we talk about. It's something that's real. And, and as a believer, I have to believe and receive the Word of God by faith. Faith is, is believing it even though you don't fully see it. I have to believe it. And, my sister and I were having a conversation today about, her, about a situation on her foot, and I said, I said, you've got to see it before you see it, or you never will receive it. If I'm praying for a healing of my body, I've got to see myself healed. 
I, I've, got to, I've got to believe that I am going to be healed long before I'm ever healed. You see it before you see it, or you never will receive it. So let me talk to you about the Holy Spirit is our helper. He's our helper. Jesus taught his disciples before he returned to heaven in John chapter 14, verse 25 and 26. This is the words of Jesus. He says, all this I have spoken while still with you. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Notice Jesus says, the Father's going to send the advocate in my name. He's going to teach you all things. He is going to teach you who? The Holy Ghost is going to teach you. And he's also going to be a witness to everything I've already told you. So I took the privilege to look up the word advocate. Okay? This is the definition of advocate. A person as of a lawyer who works and argues in support of another's cause. So if Jesus said he's going to send me an advocate, I've got somebody in my corner rolling up their sleeves. And they're going to step between me and whoever's there, and they're going to say, hold on now. I'm going to defend Jason. I'm going to be his advocate. I don't know if you want that, but dude, I want that. Because sometimes you feel alone saying, Lord, I need the receipt. You said you would be my advocate, that you would send the Spirit to be my advocate. I need the Holy Spirit right now in this place. In John chapter 15, verse 26, a little bit further down, Jesus teaches this. He says, when the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. So this is what we've got to understand. The Holy Spirit will never dishonor Jesus. The Holy Spirit will never confuse you about Jesus or what Jesus has said. It will only, he will only lift up what Jesus has already said. He will take what the Word says and confirm it in your spirit. That's what the advocate does. Well, let's go deeper, Pastor Jason. Okay. The Holy Spirit is something that we don't play with, we don't mess around with. Now listen, I'm going to be transparent. I grew up in a Pentecostal church. I pastor a Pentecostal church. When I was a kid, I didn't fully understand everything. And so as kids, we would play church in the yard. And we mimicked what we saw. I can remember playing in the yard, people laying hands and people falling out, shouting, screaming. And I remember my stepfather coming out and rebuking me for that. We're just playing. He said, no, you're playing in the wrong place. Don't mock the Holy Ghost. Don't play around. And I remember from early on, it was put into me a fear and a reverence for the Holy Spirit. And I've always told myself, do not grieve the Holy Spirit because he gets grieved. And I don't want to be the griever. But I remember just playing church and being reprimanded because we were really mocking what we were watching. And we, we would pick out certain, so be careful, we would pick out certain people that would shout funny. And we would shout. I'm just going to tell you, my, my high school basketball coach when I was a freshman, Carmen Stauffer, attended our church, and when the Holy Spirit would fall in that room, he would dance across the front of the church, and he would take his hands. I'm, I'm not this flexible, but it's like his back was on fire. He was trying to put it out, and he would dance, and he would do stuff like this. And so I remember I did the Carmen, we called it the Carmen Stauffer. I would do the Carmen Stauffer, and I got reprimanded for that. You know, it, we, were, we were innocent, but the reality was when the parents saw it, they said, don't do that. Don't, 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 don't mock that. And so I, I really, I was put in my place, and I thank God for that, because I, we were just innocent kids having fun. But I remember my high school basketball coach would feel with the Holy Ghost, and he would dance across the church. I'd run through the wall for that guy, man. 
There was a promise of the Holy Ghost, a promise of the Holy Spirit. This is the words of John the Baptist. John was the forerunner of Christ. He was to prepare the way for Christ. This is what John said in Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. He says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I am, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. This is what he wants you to watch. John says, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. I read that for the first time. I was like, my goodness. John says, I'm baptizing you here in water, but one's coming after me. I can't, I can't carry his Jordans. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost. John says, I can't do that. And John says, and he's going to baptize you with fire. And I thought, my goodness. So John's prophesying about Jesus. John's prophesying that Jesus is going to be more powerful than him. And John's prophesying, saying, he's going to give you something I can't give you. In Luke chapter, one, chapter 11, verse 13, these are the words of Jesus. Jesus says, if you then, no, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Okay, let's, uh, let's dress this down. I'm a good dad. I, I got some good dads in here, and I got some good moms. And we love our children. And you know, we give our children good things. And he says, and Jesus said, you do that and you're evil. I was <laughs> like, ooh, okay. But he said, but how much more is your heavenly father that knows good? He'll give, he'll give to his children the Holy Spirit if they ask him. So that tells me the Holy Spirit's a good thing. And I can have it. If I ask for it. Woo-hoo. Still, you guys aren't ready yet. You're not ready. I'm still priming the pump. In John chapter 16, verse 7, Jesus said this, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. So this is, where, this is where my pay grade doesn't get all the way to the top because I can't answer some things. I can't tell you why Jesus and the Holy Spirit couldn't be here together. But Jesus says, he's got to come, so i got to go. This is what I know. There are three offices, the Father, Son, the Spirit. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. That's what I know. They're, they're the same person, but in three different offices. And someone says, well, how is that possible, Pastor Jason? The best way I could describe that to you is H2O. H2O, in a liquid form, is water. In a frozen form, it's ice. In a gassy form, it's it's vapors. But it's still H2O. So when I think about the the Godhead, I got to think about them in different offices, but they're the same. So Jesus says, this this is how it's taken for me. Jesus, the Bible says in John chapter 1, he was the incarnate God. That word carnate means flesh. He was God in flesh. So picture Jesus, it's God, God is a spirit. Picture God putting on a, a costume of flesh and zips it up in the back. And this is him. He's limited to where he could be because of the flesh. He can't be omnipresent and be in flesh. So he says, I've got to go. So the Spirit can come. And then he says, he'll be with you always. Hope I'm turning, I hope the light bulb's coming on. Okay. Keep going, Pastor Jason. Thank you, thank you. Jesus had to return to the Father in John chapter 16, verse 12 through 14. He says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. (laughs) I've got to tell you something, but your mind isn't ready for it. You can't comprehend what I still have to teach you. That's what he's saying. You can't handle it. He says, however, 
when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but rather he will, he hears, he hears, wait, whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. So this is what he's saying. He says, there's parts of me you do not understand, you cannot understand. But when the spirit of truth comes, when the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to start being your teacher, your tutor. And he's going to begin to educate you, open up your mind on things that I have said to you. He's going to bring to your remembrance things that you've heard about me but not fully understand. And he's going to put the puzzle together for you. And he will not contradict what I have said. Is everybody still good? We need to walk by the Spirit, and if I'm walking by the Spirit, I'm walking in favor with Jesus Christ. I'm walking in understanding and learning and knowledge of Jesus Christ because the Holy Spirit is constantly revealing these things to me and to you. So if that said, if I ask you the question, do you want the Holy Spirit, the answer to an educated mind is yes. But pastor, he's scary. I'm scared of ghosts. He's the Holy Ghost. I want to put everybody's mind at ease today not to be afraid. The biggest fear that we all have is that he's going to ask us to do something that's uncomfortable for us to do. Is there a witness in the house? Yeah. yeah. Well, don't give me that. I don't want to do that. I'm going to, I'm going to dance like Carmen Stauffer dances. That's not what he's... Most of us are afraid that the Holy Spirit's going to ask us to leave our comfort zone. Yeah, that's right. And I'm going to tell everybody in this house, you won't mind leaving your comfort zone if somebody gives you power. Right. If somebody gives you authority and somebody gives you knowledge, you won't, you won't, you won't have a comfort zone. We're uncomfortable because we're insecure. What the Holy Spirit will do for you, he'll give you security. So can I go deeper? Let's go deeper. I'm talking about the Holy Spirit's arrival. I've never met a Pentecostal preacher that could not preach Acts chapter 2. If a Pentecostal preacher cannot preach Acts chapter 2, tell them to step down. Amen. Acts chapter 2 talks about on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came. Jesus told his disciples, tarry in Jerusalem until the Comforter comes. You'll know who he is. He'll be there. He won't deny him. I want to read to you Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit arrives in the place. Everybody open up your minds, open up your ears, open up your eyes. Receive this by faith. This is the play-by-play. -play. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Somebody say all. People that don't know what they're talking about don't read the full scriptures. The Bible's right before they said there was 120 people in this room. Amen. 120. Anyone who says it was just the, for the disciples, just the 12, they do not understand Scripture or read it. Yes. There were 120 people in this room, and it says all. Yes. Men, yes. women, yes. children. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. This is a scene. Something's happening in this room that has never happened before. Jesus said, stay until the comforter comes. And they came together like they always do for a prayer meeting, kind of service like this right here. And some, the Bible says they were all in one mind, in one accord. And all of a sudden there came a sound like a rushing mighty wind. Yeah. It said that tongues of fire fell on each one of them. Each one of them. 120 of them. Look at what it says in verse 4. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit 
and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. It was the Spirit that was enabling them. They didn't know what they were doing. It was so chaotic that the people outside thought they were drunk. You can't tell me that the early church was not Pentecostal. They were confused about being drunk. That's the, I told you what I'm going to preach on. That's the arrival. It came. That was the first mention when it fell on all of them. There were other times in the, in, in the Gospels where Jesus breathed his spirit onto his disciples. And they, they preached with power and healed people. But the spirit would leave. He'd, he'd put it back on them again. This is talking about when the spirit came and it stayed. If you want to know any prophetic words, the Bible says about, about the Messiah, the chosen one, he's, the Bible says that when in the Old Testament, when the Spirit comes down, it'll, it'll, it'll fall on men and go back, but when it falls on the chosen one, it'll stay. Jesus is the only one that the Spirit never left. When he got baptized in the Jordan by John, the Holy Spirit came upon him like a dove. The heavens opened up and God said, this is my beloved Son, and who I'm well pleased. He put all power in his hands. Are we ready? Yes. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to talk about the role of the Holy Spirit. What is his role in your life and in my life? Keep your minds open, keep your ears open, and keep your eyes open. I told you we're going to receive the word by faith, right? Yes. Let's read the word. In Acts chapter 5, verse 32, it says, We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. You will not receive the Holy Spirit being disobedient. It's not going to do it. You've got to, you've got to constantly think of a father and child relationship. If that child is disobedient, that father's not rewarding that child. We need to be good children, amen? Quit going to the woodshed. It's not a good experience out there. It hurts my pride. Luke chapter 12, verse 12 says this. For the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. Jesus told his disciples, don't even take a thought on what you should say, but let the Holy Spirit lead you. There have been many times I get a phone call and I've got to go someplace, either the hospital, someone's house, a situation, and I don't know what I'm walking into, and I pray the prayer of them, Holy Spirit, lead and guide me. Tell me to shut up when it's time to shut up. Tell me to speak when it's time to speak. Tell me what to say when it's time to say something. I don't know what I'm doing. And the Bible says that he will give us that if we ask him. So what's it like to walk by the Spirit? I'm, ta I'm constantly talking to him. Lord, help me. I don't know what to say right here. I had a situation the other day with, with a person, and they got a little rude to me, and, and you know, my, my personality is, ah! And I just, and they said it to me. I, I recognized the tone, the language, and I just said, really? And I just walked away. Holy Spirit put a muzzle on my mouth, tied my hands up. But I think, you know, the, that, what was funny is, while I was walking away from this person, Scripture came to my mind, is don't entertain a fool in their folly. <laughs> I'm thinking, okay, I'll take that. And then and the Bible says, flee the very appearance of evil. That was giving me, I was getting ready to get into something pretty bad right there, and the God shut my mouth, turned me around. Lord, thank you. That's walking by the Spirit. You can say it's your conscience. I don't, my conscience ain't that smart. The Holy Spirit, this is, I'm, giving, I'm giving you receipts. The Holy Spirit gives us power. He gives you power. In Acts chapter 1, verse 4 and 5, on one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift. Somebody say gift. Yes. Wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days... You will, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. It takes me back when John said, he goes, I baptize you with water, but he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And Jesus said, the gift is coming. 
The free gift is coming for you. Don't leave. Mm, i got to hurry. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. It says, Jesus said this, but this is Jesus speaking. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The, the, the promise is when the Holy Spirit comes upon you that you will receive power. Not power to lift, not power to, to, to be faster than a locomotive or leap tall buildings in a single bound or catch a bullet. Your power is to be a witness. I want to bring you into the life of Peter. The Bible says on the night that Jesus was arrested, Peter followed him. Peter was, was identified three times. He denied the Lord three times. Once to a little girl. He didn't have the boldness or the power even to speak up and declare anything. Jesus later restored him after the resurrection. But in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit came into the room like a rushing mighty wind, tongues of fire fell on all of them. Power came on all of them. And the Bible says people outside began to gather around thinking they were drunk. The Bible says that Peter kicked the door open. And Peter, Peter began to preach. He began to preach from the prophet Joel, or Joel. And he began to say, we are not drunk as you might think we are drunk. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. He said, but this is what was spoken of. You're old men, you're young women, you're, you're, you're old, you're young, your men, women will prophesy. He began to lay it out. If you want to hear a preaching message, you read the words of Peter in Acts chapter two, shut the doors, open your Bible, and you read it like a preacher would read it. That's how that's supposed to be read. The Bible says it was so powerful that he's a million man. What's the difference between the night Jesus was arrested and now? He's filled with the Holy Ghost. There's power upon him. He's preaching, and the Bible says 3,000 people that day came to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The difference maker, the difference maker was the Holy Ghost. He was still the same Peter. He was still the same guy. The still, he was the same cussing preacher. But the bottom line is he was filled with power. In Acts chapter 4, verse 31, after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God with boldness. One translation said, this one says boldly, but one translation, they spoke it with boldness. I wish, if I had one wish, is that everybody in this house would be filled with the Holy Ghost. Not, not, not for any, any record of anything that we would all leave this place empowered and bold. We wouldn't back down from a conversation about Jesus. That we, when, when somebody says his name the wrong way, you gotta say, excuse me. Excuse me, you're not gonna talk about my Lord. Not that we're going to fight or lay hands on people, but we do believe in a five-fold ministry, and we do believe in the laying on of hands for healing. For healing. I've got to hurry. The receipt of the gift of the Holy Spirit is through, throughout Scripture. The disciples walked with Jesus for three years. They ate with him. They slept beside him. They walked along the road with him. They watched the miracles after miracles. He rebuked them after rebuke. He corrected them. He taught them. But there was something they still didn't have. Jesus dies on a cross. He's in the grave for three days. He raises from the grave. He spends time with them again. He ascends into heaven. And they're still missing something. Jesus said, there's more. He goes, I've got to go away so the comforter, the advocate could come. He said, do not leave Jerusalem. Do not leave it until I send him to you. He is going to equip you. He is going to teach you. He is going to show you everything that I have showed you, the things that you do not understand. He's going to help you understand. He's going to give you power to do what I have showed you to do. And for some reason, they still didn't have it until Acts chapter 2. And everything, the world flips upside down after Acts chapter 2. Ooh, 
I wish I could tell you what I'm thinking. My vocabulary fails me. Jesus was limited, I know that's hard to believe, into this body. He, was, he could only be where he was at. Now he, he healed the centurion soldier from afar off. But there was limitations to the flesh. Our flesh has limitations. He knew the disciples had to spread out and get the gospel to the entire world. He goes, I can't be in this form and make this happen. So I'm going to go away so the Spirit can come and He'll be with you all the time. Peter, if you go that way, and James, you go that way, and Bartholomew, you go that way, and John, you go, he goes, I will be with all of you all the time. Today, he's with us. That feeling you have when the energy comes up in you, that's power. He's coming up through you, and you have to nurture that. You've got to guard that. And when he speaks through you, you speak. You go to the grocery store and you see somebody you don't even know, but the Holy Spirit says, I want you to give them an encouraging word. But I don't even know them. Go. And you walk up to this, I know this fruit looks rotten, but God wanted to tell me that you're not rotten, you're special and he loves you. You see tears of, well, I needed that. No one, but well, the Holy Spirit sent me. I don't know why I'm here. I know why I'm here. The Spirit sent me over here to tell you that. Be encouraged in the Lord. You're the head and not the tail. You're blessed coming in, going out. You need to be in church on Sunday. If you don't, if you don't have a church, come with me to Valley Church. <laughs> the Spirit should lead. Let's stand together. The Spirit should be leading us and guiding us. If the Spirit, if the Holy Spirit's doing His job you're doing your job as a believer things around you change people change lives change marriages change homes change and I want to tell every person in this house if you are a spirit fear believer which I hope you are how can you be in the house and not affect the house how can you be in the room and not change the room? The room needs to be different when I'm walking out of the room. It might have been chaos when I walked in, but if I walk in and the Holy Spirit walks in with me, the room has to be different when I walk out of the room. Prayer team, come, come. I'm gonna do this really quick. Corey's gonna sing a song for us. But if you're in this house today, you say, Pastor Jason, I just need, I need encouragement. I need, I need the Holy Spirit. I, I, I need power. I need to be endued with power. I've got situations I'm dealing with. I'm not handling them right. I need the Holy Spirit to speak to me, speak through me. I, Lord, Pastor, I, I just need prayer. As Corey sings this song, I just want you to come. We're not going to belabor this. But I can't talk about the Holy Spirit. I can't preach about the Holy Spirit and not give you a chance to touch Him. Okay? Let's worship together, Corey, if you will. These altars are open. Come on. Break out. Break out. Yes, Lord. Oh, come on, come on, come on. Spirit, break out. Yes, Holy Spirit. Yes, Holy Spirit.
they've been praying for the baptism of the Holy Spirit in this place. He is our teacher. He is our advocate. He is our helper. We can't do it without him. If Jesus said it's important, it's got to be important. Well, Pastor Jason, I grew up in a church. No one ever talked about that. I can't help it that you grew up inadequate with the scriptures. I gave you all the scriptures today. Not all of them. I had to cut them back. But the Bible's clear. If John said it's important, Jesus said it's important, we see the lives of the disciples changed and rearranged afterwards. Why would I try to do this walk without the Holy Spirit? Why would I try to walk for Christ blindly when he can help me? God is doing big things in your life. Don't limit the power of God in your life. You can say, Pastor Jason, that's all nice. It's good. I'm not ready for it. If you're not ready, you're not ready. I want to invite you to read, study the scriptures. He's not going to put it on you if you don't want it. He said if you ask. If you ask. Acts 19, Cornelius, he was a Gentile. His entire family, they were good people. They sent for Peter. Peter came not knowing what, what was going on. And Peter was just teaching about Jesus. And the Bible says that the Holy Spirit fell in Cornelius' house, a Gentile's home. All of his family were filled where the disciples were confused. They said the same spirit that fell upon us has now fallen upon the Gentiles. What is going on? And Peter said, it's for everybody. He's not a respecter of person. It doesn't matter how you were raised. I just want you to know the Bible. Know what the Word of God said. There's power in the Word. There's power in understanding. There's power in knowledge. Now I just want to say to God be the Lord. Corey, one more time.